Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we just want to say thank you. Uh, your word tells us all these wonderful things, that you are gracious and you are compassionate, that you are abounding in love and that you are slow to get angry. You forgive wickedness, rebellion, and sin. You so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And sometimes these things are too big. We don't know how to get our mind around it, but we just want to say thank you, Father. Thank you that you've never lied. Thank you that in the scriptures it says all the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. And so we gather today to say that we love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Spirit. We love you, Father. And we believe you the best we can. So I pray that you help our unbelief, that you transform us, that you make us what you created us to be. And then you send us out into this world that you so love to be your ambassadors, that we take this hope, this hope of, of eternal life, this hope of forgiveness, this hope of purpose here on earth, and we share it. And so I just ask you to please do, do what only you can do. You have all of the power. So Jesus, in your name, we ask these things. Amen. It really is good to see all of you. It's just, it's just good. I wish it, sometimes I wish I had a funny joke to tell because it, but I have none. So <laughs> no joke. Yeah. Who was that? <laughs> Chuck Kurt. <sighs> so this morning, my title is, if you had only known that he is stronger than death. <clears throat> I've, I, as I said, I've titled this series, If You Had Only Known, based out of Luke chapter 19, when Jesus came in on Palm Sunday and he overlooked Jerusalem and he wept and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you had only known what would bring you peace. And we live in a world, we live in a world that truthfully is afraid of death. The existential philosophers, they say that death is waiting for us all like the concrete floor waits for a light bulb. It's just a matter of when. So I, I've told you I have the greatest job in the world. I do. I love being a pastor. It's, it is the greatest job in the world. Part of the reason I'm a pastor is because when I was a young boy, I would go to church with my family all the time, and I dreaded it. It was long, and it was boring, and it'd be like, and in the book of Jonah we read. And so I was, you know, me and my friend Pat Fair, we'd play tic-tac-toe, and my dad would yank my ear, and <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. And then something very exciting happened. The church that I went to closed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I was so happy. It's so like, whoa, I don't have to go to church. And then a while later, my mom, whom I love deeply, my mom had a friend named Linda Lyons, and Linda said, well, you should come to our church. And I'm like, no, because we don't have a church, and we get to stay home. <laughs> so we, we were supposed to go to this new church, and I was supposed to go to youth group. That was my introduction to this church. So I lived on a farm at the time. Well, my whole family did. I didn't live by myself yet. We lived on a farm at the time, and my dad sent us out at about 4.30, because youth group was at 7, so we had 4.30 to 6.30 to milk. So my friend Ted and I, he lived, they lived in our basement. It's a complicated story. Ted and I go out to milk the cows. We get the cows in the barn. We turn on the milking machine, and it's like, Aah. that's what they sounded like back in the day. We did not milk any cows. And the plan was, it was a brilliant plan, that my dad would come out at 6.30, and he would see we haven't milked any cows, and he would be so angry that he would probably kick me in the butt, and then he would say, get these cows milked, and I wouldn't have to go to youth group. So 6.30 came. And my dad came out, and he was just as calm. He must have anticipated this. He was like, oh, this is all the farther you got? All right, well, you guys better get in and get ready for youth group. And I'm like, no, that's the, I don't want to go. Well, we ended up going. The, the youth worker, it was at his house. He was a cool guy. He was very athletic. He had almost made it into the minor leagues, but he could only throw 88 miles an hour, so he, he didn't quite make the cut. After youth group, we wrapped up a sock, and we were playing baseball in his yard. And then we had to go to the pastor's house to pick up my mom because she was at a Bible study or a prayer meeting or something. So Ted and I were two, like, awkward, dorky 
teenagers and we go to this house and he answers the door and he's got like boat shoes and blue jeans and he's like, hey, what are your names? Oh, I'm John. And this is Ted. And then he goes, Ted, what grade are you in? Ted goes, I'm in 10th grade. And Bob says, 10th grade? I spent three of the best years of my life in 10th grade. <laughs> And I didn't know what to do because I'm like, was he slow? Did he, did he get, is that a joke? Cause that's, that's funny. That's like, cause he wasn't what any pastor I had ever known was like. Well, that began my journey with Bob. Um, I would, I, I learned to love Jesus going to his church. Other things happened in my life, but he was part of it. I would ask him all these questions about the scriptures and he would come over and we would talk and we went camping one time, a whole youth group, and he had this white mercury topaz with red interior. And I thought that is the coolest car in the world. Someday I will have a mercury topaz. And I thought, I want to be a pastor. That's great. Well, he left the church and I was heartbroken. I went on to college. I actually went to St. Actually, truthfully, I am here today because of him, because he said I should go to St. Paul Bible College. I was like, okay, he's a pastor. I will listen. I moved to Minnesota, go to St. Paul Bible College, been in Minnesota ever since. About five years ago, I thought, you know, I want to get in touch with Bob, just see what's happening. So I called him up and I said, hey, you know, could we, like, I'll call you every week and we'll talk for about a half hour and just talk about life. It won't be, it won't be hard and fast, you know, but like if, if I'm free, I'll do it. If you're free, if it doesn't work, he said, yeah. So we've been talking, you know, probably like 40 times a, a week, uh, 40 times a week, 40 times a year um, for about the last five years. We talked Two Tuesdays ago, you know, our, our last conversation, we were talking about making disciples. You know, like, how, how do you do this? How do you, how do you make disciples effectively? And he was telling me he's retired, living in Florida. He actually turned 67 on March 11th. And he was telling me about a Bible study that he's leading at his, his adopted home church in Florida, small group. Phone calls over and I say, hey, talk to you next week. So last Sunday after church, I'm home and my mom calls and she says, Pastor Bob died. And I'm like, what? No, no, he's, he's 67. He's healthy. He runs. He's, she was no, like he, he's, he died. I called up his wife and it's true. He had been at the church work day the day before he was picking up garbage. He came in to get a new garbage bag and he was standing in the foyer talking with someone and he collapsed and they tried to revive him and he was gone. And I tell you that story today because Jesus is stronger than death. See, I'm, I'm sad for Bob's family. I don't know how his wife is going to make it. I'm, I'm sad for his kids. I'm sad for his grandkids. But truthfully, I'm not sad for him because this is the best Easter he's ever had because Jesus is stronger than death. And that's my title today. Jesus is stronger than death. In the Gospel of Luke, it says in chapter 24, oh, just to set this up, Jesus has, has died. He was on the cross and they watched him and the women watched and they were weeping and they were beating their breasts and they were crying out. And Joseph and Nicodemus, who had been his disciples, but privately because they were ashamed and they didn't want to, they didn't want to stand out to their, stand up to their friends. And they hadn't even agreed with the council, but they weren't strong enough to stop it. They've gone to Pilate and they've asked for his body and they wrapped it in aloes and myrrhs and they carried it to the tomb. And here are these two old men with the dead body of Jesus. And they put it inside of the tomb and they roll the stone and the women had watched from a distance and then the women went home and they prepared spices but it was now Friday night it was the Sabbath so they couldn't work the next day the Sabbath they couldn't work then it was the night time they couldn't go out so early the next morning on the morning of the third day it says on the first day of the week very early in the morning the women took the spices they had prepared because now they wanted to give their last best gift to Jesus because their rabbi was gone. The women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. And look at these words in verses 2 and 3. 
They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Because Jesus is stronger than death. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, the men asked a very simple question. And, and the men seemed to think, you should know this. They say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And Jesus had told them this. He, in, in the Gospel of Luke, you can look in chapter 9, he tells them this. He tells them in chapter 13. He tells them in chapter 18. But it says that the disciples didn't understand when he said this. It seems very strange. We are not accustomed to dead men getting up. We're, we're not. Then they remembered his words. And when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to 11 because now Judas is gone. Because just like Satan always does, when he has used up somebody, he discards them. Earlier, Judas was very useful. And it says that Satan entered him. He betrays Jesus. And in the Gospel of Matthew, we read this haunting account where it says that when Judas realized Jesus was going to be crucified, he was filled with regret. And he went back to the temple. He went to the priests. Because if you're a Jewish boy and you have sinned, who do you go to? You go to your priest. He went to the priest and he says, I have sinned. I have betrayed innocent blood. And this is what his priests could offer him. They said, what is that to us? That's your problem. And Judas overwhelmed. He threw the money into the temple and he went out and he hanged himself. So the, the women, they go back to the 11. And they told these things to all the others. There were others with them. It wasn't just the apostles. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they, the apostles, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. It's like, oh, what are you guys talking about? You just, I mean... I'm sure the women are pretty excited. This is quite a morning for them. They're probably out of breath because I'm assuming they have ran back. And they're like, hey, the, well, the stone was rolled away and there was the grave clothes, and, but he wasn't there. And then, and then there were the angels and the angels said he's alive. And, and they said, do you remember what he told you? And then we remembered what he told us. And, and the guys are like, Ugh, okay. <sighs> what? No, that's, yeah. But Peter he got up and he ran to the tomb, bending over. He saw the strips of linen lying by themselves and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. He's like, I wonder what happened. See, so he was crucified. He was put in the tomb. Then the women went and the stone was gone. And the angel said, He's alive, and I came and I looked, and he's not here. I can't figure this out. Now that same day, two of them, two of his disciples, not of the 11, we know because Cleopas wasn't one of them. Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And if you walk three miles an hour, that's about two hours and 20 minutes. It's, it's a good hike. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still. They're walking. And he says, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you 
only, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened? Like, are you, are you joking right now? Are you kidding with me? You wonder what we're, don't you know? Aren't you aware of what has happened? What things, Jesus said. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers, our rulers, handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped... We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And our hope is crashed. He's gone. He was crucified. And it gets even worse. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. And they came and they told us what they had, that they had seen a vision of angels who said he's alive. So when I was, when I was younger, obviously I was younger, my son, he's right here, handsome boy in the front row, he loved this TV show called Blue's Clues. We would watch, yeah, yeah, we'd watch Blue's Clues, okay? And, and if you haven't seen Blue's Clues, there's the like dog, and he goes like this, whoo, 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 whoo. and he would leave clues with his paw print, and it would be like, here's a gallon of milk, here's a glass, here's some chocolate. And then Steve would be like, ah, oh, I wonder what Blue wants. Let's sit down in our thinking chair. We'll think. And then they would think, I bet Blue wants some chocolate milk. Well, these two go on, they say, and then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus and they are stumped. I'm like, this is, this would be the easiest Blue's clues of all time. I will give you the clues, okay? Jesus said he was going to be crucified and raised to life. Then he was crucified. Then he was buried. Then the women went to find him. Then they found the stone was rolled away. Then the angel said, Jesus is alive. Then they look in the tomb and they can't find him. And they're like, we don't know... We don't know. And Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, and by the way, that would be a great Bible study to be at, to have Jesus explaining to you from Moses and the prophets. And we learn in the other gospels also from the Psalms. And it's a seven mile walk. So you have about two hours and 20 minutes and he's opening the scriptures and you're like, whoa, that's amazing. I never saw that before. It says, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread. It's kind of interesting because he's not the host. When was the last time the guest came into your house and just said, I'll take over here. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened. They recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And that had to be kind of frustrating because as soon as they knew who he was, he was gone. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And I just want to add this. If you're ever reading the scriptures or listening to the scriptures or hearing the scriptures and you feel something burning, it's because he is with you and he's opening your eyes. He's real, he's alive and he was there and their hearts were burning. 
they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. That's a seven. I mean, they just got done walking seven miles. Now they got to run back seven miles. They just, they are so excited. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and he's appeared to Simon. And I like this part because we don't know what he said to Simon. We don't know. But the last time, Simon and Peter, they're the same person. His name was Simon Peter. But the last time we read about Peter, it was when he had denied for the third time that he knew who Jesus was. And he heard the rooster crow, and he remembered what Jesus had told him. And they looked across the room, and they made eye contact. And Peter went outside, and he wept bitterly. And then he watched Jesus die. And then he heard the women talk nonsense. And then he ran to the tomb and his body wasn't there. And he didn't know what to do. And Jesus found him. And we don't know what Jesus said, but I'm sure it was good. I'm sure it was something about Peter. I told you that Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that when you have turned back, go and strengthen your brothers and it's okay. I'm alive and I forgive you and I love you. And he said, he's, he's alive and he's appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized them when he broke the bread. And you're like, this story is amazing. And then it gets better. And while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them. Because he just appeared. Just like he disappeared, he appeared. He's now in his resurrected, glorified body. And he's, he's there with them. And he says, peace be with you. Now, the rest of the story, they don't believe it's him. They think they're seeing a ghost. They can't believe this. And then he says, okay, check. And then he says, do you have anything to eat? Because ghosts don't eat. And they gave him some fish. And over the course of 40 days, he made himself known to them. And then at the end of 40 days, he gathered his disciples together in Galilee. And he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember this, I am with you always to the very ends of the earth. I am with you always to the very ends of the earth. This morning I'm, I'm reading that passage and I'm like, he's with me. He's here. He's with me. He's with us. He's here. He's with you. He loves you. He loves the world. He came and he defeated death because death is mighty. I read this quote this work this week. Death is mighty. Jesus is almighty. Death is mighty. Jesus is almighty. He's stronger than death. So I thought it's very fitting, it's very, very fitting that the last conversation I ever had on this earth with Pastor Bob was about making disciples because that was his passion. And I am here partly because he lived his life to make disciples. And I, I want us to be people that make disciples. Because see, until I told that story, none of you probably had ever heard of Bob Brown, but he changed my life because he took the words that Jesus said and he did his best to live them out. And so I, I encourage you, take the words of Jesus and live them out. Make disciples in your home, make disciples in your workplace, make disciples at Quick Trip or Walmart or Target. Wherever you go, let them know because there's a world that is terrified because they don't know anything stronger than death.
They've been told the only two things you can count on are death and taxes. Well, I'll tell you something that you can count on. It's that Jesus is stronger than death and the grave is not the end because the women went to his tomb and it was empty. He was risen. He has risen. Okay, that's your cue. One more time. Well, that's okay. Yeah. You weren't asleep, so. He has risen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, please, you have to do it. You know what we are. Uh, you, you know us. Like the thief on the cross, uh, we know who we are and we know what we have done and we know what we deserve, but Jesus... You loved us so much that you took what was rightfully ours. You who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. In your flesh, you crucified sin. What the law was powerless to do, you did, God, by sending your son in the likeness of flesh. And so I just ask you to fill us with hope and fill us with joy and fill us with power so that we go out and we are your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. For your kingdom and your glory, we pray. Amen.